Mill Serp Garage. Welcome to the United States Rifle Caliber 30, model of 1917. Uh, this is sometimes called the M1917 Enfield, sometimes misidentified as the P17, P1917 pattern 17. I'm going to show you where that comes from and uh, talk a little bit about this battle rifle. This is a true battle rifle, if there ever was one. This is the epitome of rock solid 306 blasting battlefield monster. Model of 1917, Eddie Stone. Uh, yes, Eddie Stone. We'll discuss that. And um, this is kind of like a mix of uh, some American stuff thrown into a British rifle that was a copy of the Mauser design. So, uh, certainly has a, uh, certainly has an interesting lineage, let's say. But, uh, so let's break it down a little bit. Um, these things were made originally as, um, British rifles in 1913, I believe. They first started to be made in England, you know, actually in in Enfield, I'm pretty sure the name of the place was uh, was uh, Enfield Royal Small Arms Factory at Enfield Arsenal. Um, they were called the uh, Pattern 1913 Enfield. Um, they were a little bit different than um, this design that you see here. They uh, had a lot of carryovers from Lee Enfield uh, rifles, and. Um, they were chambered in a different cartridge than the regular 303 British cartridge that we're used to. Um, but when World War I started, in the UK, they were just like, oh, no, we need a whole bunch of rifles right now. We have a whole bunch of this 303 ammo. So we're just going to, they just abandoned the whole, they abandoned that whole thing. And they, um, they uh, changed the rifle to, uh, to 303 and they called it the pattern 14 they made a couple of changes and they asked for help from us to help them produce it so we were making them they were called p14s that's why the misidentification of this one as a p17 that was never really the name of it but that p thing comes from p14 which is pattern 14 and uh, winchester and remington made these things for britain we weren't in the war yet, you know. And uh, there was a third manufacturer, Eddie Stone Arsenal, which was a subsidiary, subsidiary of Remington that um, made rifles at a, a locomotive factory in Eddie Stone, Pennsylvania. They started tooling up rifles there. And uh, so that's why you have three versions of the P14 um, that were made by Winchester, Remington, or Eddie Stone. And then uh, when we entered the war, um, we had the same problem where we didn't really have uh, that many rifles. Now, so we just did the 03 Springfield. We didn't really have many of those things, like, eight, like less than a million of them, you know? And there were difficulties in production with the, with the 03 Springfield. So then, in, since we were already making these Pattern 14 rifles for England, we just decided, you know what, it's going to take too long to switch everything over to start making 03 Springfield. So let's just, uh, let's just modify the Pattern 14 rifle for ourselves, you know what I mean? And we'll just, we'll just keep making the same thing. It'll be much easier to just keep making the same rifle. And uh, we'll just adapt it to ourselves. 
So that's exactly what they did. They adapted it to um, to uh, chamber a uh, 3006 cartridge, which was a uh, it was a non-rimmed cartridge. Now, so it was a, you know a little bit different. There had to be some changes to the bolt face and to the magazine and certain things. But um, we made those changes. Were there were much less changes that would have to be made to completely retool for a different rifle. So. Uh, and then uh, we started making them at uh, Ilion, New York, and Eddie Stone, Pennsylvania for Remington, and in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, Winchester was cranking these things out. Now, some interesting things about them were that uh, Winchester, the first, the Winchesters are the, they're like kind of like the desirable ones. You'll always see at gun shows, people always, and they, when they see these, they're always like, is it a Winchester? Is it a Winchester? I think it's just a question of numbers. Like, Eddie Stone made... Let's see, I got no, raw numbers here. I don't know how accurate these are, but I actually have some raw numbers. Eddie Stone made 1,181,908 of these. Uh, Eddie Stone did. Um, and Remington... 545,541 and Winchester 465,980. So supposedly around the first 5,000 or so of the Winchesters just had a W on the receiver until they actually wrote Winchester on it. And I you know I've seen them it doesn't just it doesn't just printed Winchester it actually has like the Winchester monogram like written in the Winchester kind of uh what's that called again the uh the way uh the the Winchester banner let's say you know uh, let's see, what else do we have here? They, uh, yeah, so those, so the Winchester ones are supposed to, supposedly the ones, you know, that are desirable. And they also tooled up a, uh, a bayonet for these things. And the bayonets are sick. Um, let's see what they got on the keyboard for the bayonet. Well, it had this leather scabbard here and you guys got to be careful there's certain bayonets have these they're and they're all the same they're the way they're bonded right here you have to be careful see this is like a weak spot right there you see that so you don't want to ever want to grab it here i think that's what starts to get it coming apart is people grabbing it like that you have to let me just make sure you grab it by the metal to take the blade out to take the actual bayonet out so uh we got the flaming bomb the eagle head U.S. and there's an if you see that X there, I think that's a proof mark that it's like you know like a bend, a bend proof or something like that. And uh, the Remington insignia in 1917. These bayonets do not fool around, and this is the same bayonet that you'll see that goes on the trench guns and stuff like that. This is a cool one. If you got a lot of mill soaps, like if you got some trench guns and you got one of these you you gotta have one of these bets you can find them they're around this is one of those this is one of those gun show finds they're around the gun shows you see them on tables they're out there uh so yeah let me grab sorry just want to grab my uh my stripper clip my realistic snap caps and um, six rounds fit in here because when we went from the rimmed cartridge of the, the 303 rimmed cartridge, we had like a little bit of extra room. But still, look at the belly on this thing. It's almost like 10 rounds would fit in this magazine because of that belly. But uh, yeah, we had a uh, stripper clip guide up here. And uh, those went in crooked. And that was a complete catastrophe right there. There it goes. <laughs> that was not impressive at all. They're totally whacked out in here. They're not in here right at all. So let's... Here we actually show how we uh, open up the... Uh, you know what? It's supposed to be done with the tip of a bullet. But why mar it if we don't have to? Always use wood whenever uh, possible. Wood is always going to, uh, you know, always do no damage to metal. It's almost impossible. 
and this is uh, thoroughly jammed here. Great. Oh, it looks like I just I just ironed it out. Yeah, these are Swedish stripper clips that I try to run through these, but they don't always uh, work like the originals uh, would. It's kind of uh, it's kind of unfair to do that, and then it looks like they don't work right. But with the right magazine, with the right uh, stripper clip, that would have worked awesome. These uh, snap caps, by the way, are. Uh, sold uh, on uh, realisticsnapcaps.com coupon code Milsert Garage gets you 10% off and free shipping as always so very conventional Mauser design here let's take a closer look at that if we can so once again we have controlled feed you don't have to close the bolt on the round to capture it and this is a cock on closing design so you can see the charging cock and piece right here on closing which is a little bit different than how we did it with the O3 Springfield. This was more the traditional. Um, this was more the traditional Mauser design, the like export Mauser designs. Whereas the K98 was a clock on opening. Um, this is more the um, clock on closing type of the export Mausers. Uh, the safety, a little different. Not like the typical Mauser safety. It was thumbed right here. and uh, But it does have the typical Mauser bolt release, which is interesting. But the non-rotating collar here, the dual locking lugs up front. This should be looking crazy familiar by now. You know, the ejector that runs through the locking lug like that. There's these gas escape holes that were built into the into these. It was very important to be able to escape the gas. This dog-legged bolt, hole, bolt um, handle was interesting just to bring the bolt handle closer to the trigger to make uh, things a little bit faster. You can see here, let's... Uh, Let's zoom in a little bit here and get some of these markings. We got a flaming bomb here. Let's see a double struck E for Eddie Stone over here. There's another E. You see like a lot of these E's here on the uh, cockney piece. There's an E. So you see that they um, they definitely marked uh, the parts. Let's um, let's take a look. We could explore that a little bit more. Let's get the bolt in. chamber so let's, uh, let's zoom in nice and tight here and look at some of these uh, markings so here on the safety we have an E for Eddie Stone you can see a lot of these E's all over here inside the site we have an E there. Here's interesting. Here's just what's interesting is the 
the slider here. See, there's an E here also on the this part of the site, on this part of the site. But here, on this part that rises up and down here, this is the aperture, there's a W for Winchester. So you see there's something when it was re-arsenaled was changed here. Uh, there's an interesting little mark right there. I don't know what that is. But that's interesting, right? Not sure what that is there. Is that a mark or is that just a dent? <laughs> Not sure. And uh, here we have a uh, another flaming bomb here. And we have, uh, this might be like a unit marking on, stamped into the stock there, like that. Uh, what do we got down here? We got a, uh, it was always this P, this proof mark here, P. And interesting, like, uh, down here, see how these are staked? It's not as close to the screw as it's supposed to be. It was a little sloppy work where it's not quite on the screw, but these are supposed to be staked. See, same here. There were other staked screws. Where were they? I'm trying to remember which screws they were. Let's see if I could remember. I saw some other ones, but it's escaping me now. Uh, where else? Let's uh, let's let's zoom out a little bit. And let's uh, use this dowel to take off the magazine plate now. Now that we don't have any pressure on it there, it shouldn't be that much of a problem. Let's lay it sideways. If we push in that button, and the magazine plate should go rearward. Why is it not uh, moving? Yeah. I haven't really had a problem with that before. So what do we got on here? Let's zoom in a little bit here. Oops, sorry. Hmm, interesting mark right there. Not really sure what that is. The bottom plate here, you could see the machining on it. And there's a W in there, see that? So it looks like this bottom plate might be a, uh, a Winchester, a Winchester plate, this bottom plate here. And there's the spring and the top, uh, the top piece to follow, there's an E on there for Eddie Stone. So that's the, uh, That's the magazine. And to get this back in, should just have to press. It should just go right in. Oh, this was always one of the easier magazine floor plates to manipulate. I'm surprised I'm having this much trouble with it. Hmm. Oof. It's a little bit of a pain in the ass there. Uh, what else do we got? We have markings up here. Sure. Let's zoom in a little bit and see what we got up here. We have, uh, oops, sorry. We have a date stamp here somewhere. What is that? Are we missing it? There is 918, so September of 18. So kind of like a late production. I know there's a couple of E's up here on this site somewhere because I know I've seen them before. There's some, uh, looks like there's different site 
options there. That one's that's numbered 0.090 or so or six something. I can remember where those other staked screws were because I know I had seen other staked screws on here. They're definitely not these, obviously. Let's uh, zoom out a little bit here. Let's see if I can. Uh, how many screws are on the rifle? I mean, come on. It's gonna be. Uh, it'll be obvious if there's screws here that are staked where would they be hmm. blow my mind up because i know that there were some i have to like stop the video and pour over the rifle like a psychopath where the hell hmm. that's strange i'm sure there were other staked screws they were staked a little bit better than these were. Hmm. Well, either I'm having a senior moment or I'm gonna find it afterwards and it's gonna be a, another one of the million reasons I have for erasing an entire video. Well, I'm not wasting any more time on it, but so, what else do we have here? Is that a new? Or is that? I'm not sure. And we have a. Uh, oops. Maybe I should be jumping that close. We have a uh, butt stock uh, oiler, just like the. Uh, L3 Springfield is similar. The rubber on the back here. It's leather, actually. To uh, hold the noise down. Is it those? No, those screws aren't staked. I don't know what I could have possibly been looking at. What could I have been looking at? I get, I'm going to hate myself. Also, uh, no, you wise guys out there, this isn't the same care sling uh, carried over from the other rifle. It's my other one, and it is real. A care, no buckle. This one is also in excellent shape. I love these. This is how you tell these, these rivets here, how they're, how they're constructed is always uh, the easiest way to tell the phonies from the real ones. These things have uh, really dried up. They're not easy to, uh, they're not easy to find around anymore. Not that they ever were, but definitely uh, relics now. So yeah, let's see. We could touch on uh, maybe we could touch on a little bit more uh, history for you here. Let's see what else we got. Uh, so yeah, there's you know they they, they outnumbered the uh, the old three Springfields out there in the in the in the field by um, by like three to three to one seventy five percent of the uh, American Expeditionary Force in France were armed with 1917s. So this was really the rifle that you saw, that you saw out there. And, and these things were refurbed and they were used for World War II. And, you know, they were around. These things were a staple for quite a while. Let's take a, uh, let's take a pass and take a look and, uh, See exactly what it uh, looks like. Wow, this thing this thing really does look nice. So this is, I didn't even BLO it or anything. This is just how it came right out of the uh, rifle case, and I haven't had it out in a while. So, yeah, you know what else I was thinking about? I was thinking about um, with these realistic snap caps, right? I was showing how, like, uh, you know, you use these things for drills and, 
and somebody somebody had said to me it wasn't a comment it was uh, somebody that I know that saw this this that video the, the last one I did where I was talking about how you could cycle one round into the next he was he saw that and said yeah well you know if you really wanted to be if you really truly wanted to be safe you would render the handgun that you were training with um, non-operational like taking out the firing pin let's say so it would still cycle you'd still be able to pull the trigger on most most um, uh, handguns without the firing pin let's say even training guns where the firing pin is filed off let's say you know what I mean so it's still in there but it just doesn't reach through the reach face to hit to hit around and then you'd be safe no matter what you'd never be able to have an accidental discharge but what I was showing that's not true because a round could even just hit the ground just right to go off or it could be contacted by the bolt in a weird way or something like that so rendering the gun not rendering the gun where it doesn't fire doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to have an accidental discharge it just means that it's not going to fire in the conventional way but it, it could still be a mishap where the prior primer gets contacted in a certain way to set the round off the coolest thing about these realistic snap caps is that there's no way to set these things off because they're not set offable it's it's just they're inert and that's the ultimate safe way to do it is to have ammo that's inert period now if you mix it up with ammo that's not inert like other people say like oh well you know you make them look so real uh the real danger is that you'd mix it up with real ammunition so, so you know that's just stupid you <laughs> know like what what can I tell you? That's just, that's just idiotic. That's just like, you know, like I thought I was wearing my parachute, uh, but when I jumped out of the plane, I realized it was my daughter's book bag. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, it wasn't my fault because the book bag was easily confusable with my parachute when I went parachuting. You know, what I mean? it's like, that's, that's silly. That's, that's 101. You shouldn't be mixing up uh, school kids book bags with your parachutes and you shouldn't be mixing up your inert snap caps with live ammunition it only makes sense like you figure out how to do that you know what i mean you can't be helped if you're gonna make a mistake like that you're just not checking stuff it's kind of like an accidental discharge when you're at the range you know using live ammo if you pull the trigger and there's a round in there that's your fault somehow it didn't it didn't happen you know it's negligent discharge and accidental discharge are two totally different things you know what i mean look them up there's like even two definitions for it but anyway i just wanted to draw draw home the point that with the real true safety the reason why i profess that these things are the best thing to use like no matter what other angle you try to come up with saying like well you can use real ammo if the gun is rendered where you know it can't shoot that's that's just only one way that ammunition can be set off like as i showed there are several different ways but uh, it is nice this thing that it's really nice with this mauser design how the loading single rounds like that how nice and smooth it was always so nice at the range i remember when i first saw hickok loading rifles that way just putting in one round at a time like that and, and shooting it was, just seemed so relaxing and these, they're very, they're a very robust design. These feed ramps are beautiful. The way this is designed, it's very smooth. They're very, very nice. The cock on closing design works well with the 3006. You get a lot of momentum with that bolt coming forward. And, um, and when you open it, after firing, right, when you open it, it's nice. It's a nice smooth ejection, you know what I mean? Listen to that. That that uh that hammer drop there too is it's like a trip hammer going off. Listen to that. Oh my god. You're setting off anything. Listen to that. Oh my god. That's some power right there. So the 1917. Yeah, this is what we went to war with. Look at this cool sight. This tipped up. And then you had uh, this aperture. But the regular sight wasn't aperture sight. This is loved. This sight is loved. 
by shooters because of this uh, this aperture sight. Brit the Brits really love that. Kind of reminds me of like the uh, you know like a number five jungle carbine sight sort of you know what I mean? that one the one you saw at the same site that was on the long branch it kind of reminds me of that one that British site and I guess it is I mean it was designed after their pattern I suppose and look at this protector these super strong protective ears that are up here it's a very distinctive look and this gives for a very long sight radius where normally there would be a sight like on the Mausers it would be like over here somewhere and you would just have like a sight radius from here to the to the site the front sight. Now this way back here gives a much longer sight radius, much more accurate. And then plus, because that aperture sight is so close to you, it's not like you're just looking through like a teeny little pinhole and you can't see. It's actually kind of large. When you first shoot these, you look and you're like, "Wow, where do I even put the front sight?" Because you see a very large ring, and you're like, "Where in that front sight do I put that?" that's just the whole idea is that with this long sight radius you have a very very exacting spot where your point of impact is going to be once you learn where the rifle is hitting uh, where to hold you can be very very accurate with a sight like this with the where the front sight floats in a large ring because uh the ring is really large that just makes it all the more easier to just get the front sight right dead center in the middle of it or wherever it needs to be once you learn how the rifle where to hold you know you see how this bolt handle hangs out right over the trigger like this with this dog leg pretty cool right and the safety right in here too like everything's all just all dumped in here so that when you when your hands on this rifle here you're uh right in here your safety easily accessible with your finger and uh, after you shoot you're basically coming up out of here and you're right on that bolt you know what I mean yep look at how that's uh, routed out this this sort of functions again as a uh, as a form of a uh, locking lug so, sort of I mean it's, it's pretty tight in there what I do notice about these though is that there's a little like looseness right here you know and with these with there these are like they it, it rotates as it goes into battery if you if you'll notice watch here let me zoom in a little bit it's very important how the lock up on these as far as head spacing right here now you could see how I'm turning the bolt because you could see you could see the actual bolt turning here. And you could see how deep it is inside the chamber by looking at where the collar is. So now watch, this is this is it closing, all right? There's the locking lugs, you see that? If I push in, now they're engaging into their, into their locking lug. The locking lugs don't just go straight down. Look at how, as I push down, do you see that? See that movement right there? That lateral movement? that's what's setting the head spacing so it's very important that the bolt be at least that far down so there this play you see it moving right see that play right there see how it's moving in and out you could see it if you look way up here in the corner where there's that gap you could see it there but just this little bit of movement here is changing the head space so you do have to be careful that when you because what i'm doing here is this is all i'm doing right here it's very easy for it to be there, and it will it will fire. See, and and you see how the hand, the bolt handle moved. You know, so that's a little odd. There's the primary extraction right there, and then you would eject. So let's put a case in, so it's like the head spacing on that case. So see when you when your head spacing here, you can see it coming down. Now watch, that's not all of it. You see, there's still still a gap there. Now watch, it kind of pauses for a second. And then there's a second, watch, you see it. I, I could actually feel it right there, headspace on the kit, like, I could feel it squeeze the rim right there. Honestly, I could feel that, like right there, it kind of stopped, and there's that little bit of right there. It's real important that the bolt stays there when you pull the trigger, squeezing that rim like that to headspace it.
Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then here's the primary extraction. So as you're twisting, you're pulling back at the same time that you're twisting. That right there. That's the primary extraction. Then that's enough to release it where you'd be able to pull straight back without a problem. And uh, there is no problem. These things, they really, they cycle well. They really do. And again, you, uh, you're ill-advised to try to push them. Well, this one, see, I guess because it's cock on closing, this kind of jumped, the, the, the extractor kind of jumped over the rim a little bit easier than it would on the 1903, but it's still not advisable to do that. So, uh, yeah. What else? Man, what a battle rifle, huh? They really are animals, these things. They're, they're freaking huge. They're heavy. Well, not on, on game. They're not, they're not big where they're, like, you know, tough to maneuver around or whatever, but they're heavy. They're heavy, and they feel really solid. And uh, you definitely... Uh, you definitely want to sling this thing over your shoulder if you're carrying it. You don't want to walk carrying it because it would get heavy real fast. So what else we got? Let me see if I got anything left here in my info. Variants. No, that's boring. That's about it. <laughs> that's all I got for you. This is the British uh, copy in the Mauser design in about 19... You know, 1913 uh, to 1914, let's say, right in there. And they were, like, uh, asking America to help them build these things. And we did. And then uh, when we entered the war, we were like, oh, if you don't mind, we're going to build a bunch of these for ourselves. So the Germans were up against it with these things, man. These things were definitely kicking their ass in uh, World War One. And uh, this is a 1918 vintage um, battle rifle right here. And uh, that's the story, folks. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, don't forget about these guys. Trust me, you will not be disappointed with these guys. It's, it's, uh, this one takes six, so it's tough. You know, if you really wanted to load this thing fully, um, uh, you could get, I think he sells uh, an M1 Grand uh, kit where it's an end block and eight of them. So you could do, if you got that, you'd be able to use it for the Grand, any five round, uh, you know, like the old three rifles. And you'd also be able to fully load this guy. Uh, me, I just bought the five rounds. So, but listen, check these things out. Look at how, look at these things. I've been beating on these things now for over a month. Look at them. They're just, uh, None worse for wear. They got scratches, but uh, the way he puts these things together and the way he bonds these bullets. Oh, and you got to check out his website because he has like kind of like an F you to Amazon because uh, he was selling these on Amazon and Amazon started giving him grief. So like, because they're very non-Second Amendment supportable. They sell books and stuff like that on guns, whatever, but it's like parts and things and accessories and stuff. It's starting to go away more and more and more. And they told him that... Uh, they, they don't want him selling these anymore. And that's one of the things that made me want to get in and support this guy. But, um, you know, he talks about it on, on his website a little bit. Go check it out. He's got a really cool website. He's got a lot of interesting information. These things are cool for a number of reasons. They're made in the United States with equipment that was produced in the United States. Like, everything is all... even. He won't even use equipment that's built somewhere else. You know what I mean? It's like he's very um, a very patriotic dude. So I think it's an Arizona company, or um, maybe it was uh, Nevada. I'm not a hundred percent sure. It's out there in the uh, out there in the West somewhere in the Southwest. Uh, I'd love to place to pay this place a visit and do a video on it. Wow, that would be a really cool vacation. Hmm. Well, anyway, but um, uh, realisticsnapcaps.com coupon code Millsurp Garage one word. We'll get you 10% off, which I'm telling you, they're a bargain without the 10% off. Doesn't even charge shipping. And he works out deals with you. Like, if you got some kind of, like, shooting school and you want to get, like, every caliber that the guy has, trust me, he's going to work out a deal with you. Very good uh, people over there. So, 
that's it for the 1917 nice and uh we'll be back real soon i know i said i was going to do this video yesterday but uh i did it started it was like halfway through and it just wasn't working out so i trashed it um this one i kind of sound like i'm on like ludes or something so i don't even know if i'm going to keep this one it just was a real tough day at work a lot of running around pouring rain all day but uh this rifle's just sitting there and i just really wanted to get it up there and uh, show it to you guys and talk about it so i hope you don't mind the uh chillaxed video i hope i didn't bore it there's people sleeping right now i'm sure but look here even these see these holes see these like gas escape holes these were very important uh in this era ammo wasn't that great like you know you don't really have misfires now but back then it happened grasping grooves oh oh thank god this is gonna make this video all the more worth it Here's the uh, staked um, things I was talking about. See how these are staked? I'm so glad I found that. I thought they were screws. That's why I was. I did. I looked at those and I just kind of skipped right by it. I am zoomed in. It's easy to see, but from from where I'm looking at it, it's really tough to see. But you see how they uh, they stake these? That's why I don't mess with these. Don't take them out if you don't have to or whatever. Just leave them alone. You take the rifle apart. I don't think you need to mess with those. But it's very important that. And those have something to do with locating the action in the stock. So that's why they put them where they're supposed to be and then they stake them because they don't want these things to move that would affect the accuracy. I think there's one on the other side. Is there? No, I guess there's just that one. I thought there was another one. But uh, there is not. But yeah, but that was um, that was very important to make sure that stayed where it was. And you can see that in the life of this rifle. This, it hasn't uh, moved and i'm not sure i know you're gonna think that that's a crack right there but i'm not 100 sure i think that just the uh shellac that's on it ran in a weird way i do not think that that's a crack don't know but i've blasted away with this thing and that has not changed so <laughs> i did kind of see that originally and thought maybe it would be something that would start separating but nope so that's that, everyone. You all take care. I'm going to be back soon with a new video on something else. I'm going to go down, uh, I think we're going to explore that Browning A5 uh, follow up shotgun that Remington had. Pretty cool. This is a real obscure one. You're going to like it. Stay tuned. See you all later.